And if you have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask you to turn to Revelation, Revelation chapter 6. And uh, while you're turning there, I failed to mention that there will be um, the fellowship meeting this Friday night at Northside Baptist Church in Elkton, Kentucky. Uh, and Brother Sean Trescott will be the evangelist, I think. That's the last I knew. So uh, be in prayer for that service. And if you can attend, uh, please do so. We plan to be there and uh, see what the Lord might do. Uh, Revelation chapter 6, and we're going to begin reading in verse 12. Revelation chapter 6, and beginning in verse 12, the Bible says, And I beheld, when he had opened the sixth seal, that, lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when it is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of earth, and the great men, and the rich man, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman and every freeman hid themselves in dens and in, in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. And the great God of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for all your goodness and your watch care to New Testament Church. Lord, we pray this morning that you would honor your word with your spirit. God, we pray that you would draw us together again as a people unto you. Lord, speak to the lost and save their souls. Lord, speak to the redeemed and draw us closer to you. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, maybe not as familiar verses of Scripture, and uh, this is my opinion, but and so you can take an opinion for what it's worth, but I believe that the book of the Revelation uh, displays uh, the same story twice, and seven different parts, seven different judgments, and two different times, it tells the same story. And then about the last six chapters, it tells of the coming of Christ. And of course, the first three chapters are letters, are church letters. And even on those, there's different differences in opinions. I believe they were true church letters because those churches did exist in Asia. They were real groups of believers. And some teach it as a dispensational thing with the church wax, uh, waxing worse and worse as the years go by. And the only issue I have with that is the best of the church age then would have been the church uh, at, at uh, uh, Philadelphia, and that's in the very middle of what happened. So that dispensational teaching doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But at any rate, you take it for what it's worth. It is a prediction of the coming of our Lord God. Uh, so with that thought, we see uh, the, uh, the foretelling of the seals. Now, in our modern day postage system, a letter can be opened by anybody. Now, I have kind of an issue with that. My wife does not. She'll open anything that comes through the mailbox. Uh, but uh, you can ask my daughters, uh, if I get a letter for Sarah, I put, it on the, I put it on a bookcase that's in front of the door to her room because you know what? That's addressed to Sarah. I don't have any business with it. And so with all my children, and uh, if it's addressed to me, I rip it open because that letter is for me. Now, in the modern day postage system, it does come to our house, but anybody can open it. Now, in that day, there was seals. 
And that's something totally different than a postage stamp. A postage stamp pays your fee, it sends your letter, and it arrives where it's supposed to, but in reality, you don't know who's going to open it. Now, in, in, the, dispensa in, in the time when there were seals, the only person that could unseal it is the one that was it was addressed to. And, and that, that, that was the end of that postage type system. Now here we see a spiritual realm of that thing, and the only person that could open this judgment letter was the judge himself. Now, we talk a great deal about the judgment of God and the judgment of Christ, and, and we kind of forget about he has the authority to do so. So when he is right, when he is opening this letter, he has the right to do so. He has the only right to break the seal. And so that, you know, you want to know when judgment comes? Whenever God wants it to, because he has the authority to break the seal. And, and so we see that. And be, so beginning uh, again in verse 12, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. Now, this judgment is so powerful that it literally shakes the earth. Now, you don't see it a whole lot anymore. I don't know if they backed on out of it or, or, or the maneuvers or the, the defense that they now use is different. But when I was a boy, and even when we first moved out to Bumpus Mill, when we came back from West Tennessee, sometimes the bombs would be so strong from Fort Campbell, it would rattle your windows. And uh, I heard my father-in-law told me there was an old Nazarene church uh, that it literally destroyed the building uh, uh, out on 120. And that's the type of stuff you see with the judgment of God. I don't think it'll be a simple earthquake. I'll be, I believe it'll be the power of His holiness and His righteousness and His judgment so strong, it will literally shake the earth. And that, that, that is what's coming in the days ahead. And so we see that the first, the first portion of this displays who he is. And the sun became black. Now I've taught on that, I've preached on that uh, a lot down through the years. And uh, there's a couple of ways you can take this. Uh, in, the, in the judgment of Egypt, if you remember that, and this is a section of judgment, uh, there was a darkness that the Bible describes how? A darkness that could be felt. Mm -hmm. uh, a deep darkness. You know, you know why we have uh, homosexuals running our country? We're in a deep darkness. We're, we're in a darkness that can be felt. We're in, we're in a darkness that, uh, the, that's never been, uh, that's unprecedented to what we see. And that's what we'll have at this time, a darkness that can be felt. Uh, and you know what? Uh, I'm, uh, and either I'm stupid or I just trust God that much, but weather has never bothered me. Uh, you know what? If a tornado rips the double wide apart, you know why it happened? Because God wanted it to happen, right? If, if, uh, uh, if Job can lose everything and say the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord, you know what? I can too. And, and so we see, I don't get, uh, you know when the sky gets black, a lot of people get, uh, get kind of troubled, don't they? Mm -hmm. I mean, Donna's talking about uh, uh, making that steep bank in the back of our house useful and building a root cellar back in there and starting to try to get some beds on the backhoe work and stuff like that. And um, I said, well, I guess if a storm comes up, we could go and get in the root cellar. And she said, Larry, by the time it happens, it'll all be over. And I had not thought about that. And I was like, well, I guess she's right. Uh, only thing then, we'd be in uh, under the ground and still couldn't get out, right? And, and so uh, this, this storm, uh, this lack of God is very, very real. And, and sometimes we trouble ourselves. And the only thing I can tell you, dear friend, this morning is it's going to get worse. The, the blackness or the darkness is only going to get worse to the coming of Christ. So we see that as well. And then, 
Uh, he says, and the moon became his blood. Now that's a red moon, and you know what? That's a reality that happens. Now, again, other people say that perhaps this blackness that the Bible talks about here is a solar eclipse. You know, we're having one next year, I think it's April 25th or so, somewhere, and it's going to be a full eclipse, and I guess the crazy people will all be back down in our area again, because I think, again, the height is at Hopkinsville. You know, uh, I don't think I'd live in Hopkinsville, do you? I'd have to know that God was in it. And uh, so uh, it could be a, a time basis. A red moon is created by the position of the sun to the moon. And it, and it cast off a different shadow, and it becomes red. Another way that you can tr perhaps track what these events mean. And, and so we see uh, it could be the reality of the, uh, of the judgment of God, and it also could be a timetable that we as the Lord's people are given. The stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Now, I personally believe this, and again, the judgment of God, he uses whatsoever he will. He judges whatsoever he pleases to do, but I think this will be a meteor shower. And I believe it will, it, it will be the largest one and the most ferocious one. And, you know, a lot of times meteors, uh, we call them shooting stars frequently, uh, they don't make it to the earth. Why? They burn up before they get here, right? What if they didn't? You see, that's the judgment of God. You, you know why they mostly burn up now? Because God wants them to. You know how they would survive till they got to the earth and began to land, land on buildings and on bridges and on people? Because God wants them to. You see, you, you see what I'm saying? And, and so we see this other portion where there'll be literally rocks falling from the sky, meteors coming down, uh, uh, stars falling from heaven. And then it says, even as the fig tree casteth her untimely figs that is shaken by the mighty wind. Now, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I know the comparison is this. First of all, that it, it truly does happen. Um, and it seems to be that they were very familiar with that because they all knew what fig trees was. They all uh, used them to eat, and they, they were involved in the harvesting. And uh, what's the problem with an untimely casting you lose your harvest right and if you lose your harvest brother jody's our farmer what happens ultimately you go hungry right if you lose your harvest and, and so we see uh that that would be and i don't know much about figs because they're not real popular around here but i do know uh, from apples and peaches, what little bit of fruit that's around here, if they're cast off, they're not good for anything. Uh, this, this tree over here one time, and I've been trying to pray for it, and had to give us peaches since we built the building, and uh, uh, one time it came a storm, and all the peaches fell off, and they were about only about that big, and you could break a window with them. They were so hard. That's casting them too quick. And, 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 you know, nobody was over here when, when the peaches fell off at that time and the wind knocked them all off. But you know what? I bet it wouldn't have felt too good to get hit by one of those peaches carried by a strong wind. That's the judgment of God. And the heaven departed as a scroll. Now, this is very, very significant. And... Uh, the Bible teaches of three heavens, right? The first heaven, which I believe is the sky. It's getting a little cloudy right now. Uh, the second heaven is, is the, where the planets and the stars exist. And the third heaven, because you know it says that John was caught up into the third heaven when he got this prophecy, is the abode of God. Now, when this scroll rolls back, I personally believe you will be able to visualize the abode of God. Now, have you ever imagined the time that you step into that place and finally behold the person of Christ? 
You finally get to sit at His feet and worship Him and, and give Him praise for saving your soul. Well, could you imagine just as easily it just ripping open and you see Him suddenly? That's what's going to happen. The scroll's going to be open. It, it, it's not the book of the law. That comes in chapter 20. It's literally seeing God. Now, we'll find... In a moment, you know, I've heard people all my life, well, if I could just see him, I would believe. No, you wouldn't. Belief is a gift of God. We'll see these people literally see the third heaven, and they still want to avoid God. You know what, this craziness of, uh, uh, and I've heard it all my life, you know, uh, Darwin's theory, um, They've had to keep extending the timetable, haven't they? Mm -hmm. When I was a boy, well, yeah, this earth is a million years old. When I was in college, well, it's at least 10 million. And now they're saying a billion. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because the explanation doesn't work. It's false, and it, it doesn't even make sense. And so they've extended their timeline, and I'm sure you young people will live to the, they'll have to finally say, well, no, we was wrong, it's a trillion years. You see what I'm saying? And this is the same bunch of people, they behold the mighty God of heaven, they behold his very abode where he lives, and notice the response. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. Now, uh, remember the original earth? It was one continent. You remember that? And because of the judgment of God and the Tower of Babel, remember it says that he separated it out? It's going to go back. And, and this is part of it. it. It says they were moved out of their places. You know what that means? They were being moved back together and, and coming back around. And, and, and so we see that that's going on again. And you know what? If the good old USA, and if you've seen, and again, it's just kind of a, uh, it, this is, I guess, kind of a theory, but you can look to this, and Africa pretty much fits right there. And uh, can you imagine when all that begins to come together, you know what? You'd think that it would get somebody's attention. You would think, oh man, I was wrong this whole time. He really is on the throne. He really does do what seemeth good unto himself. But notice their response. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich and mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man. So that goes from the kings down to the slaves. You know who that is? That's everyone. Now, remember on our timetable where we're at, the Lord's people have withdrawn, and the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, has been withdrawn, and seven years it has been pure living hell on this earth. And you know what? You'd think you would get a gut pull. You, you would think that would get your attention. You would think to, you would begin to say, oh my, oh my, the God of the Bible is real. But none of them do it. And you know why? The vehicle, what makes the scriptures real, and then instead of just empty words on a page, the Holy Ghost is gone. You know, the only time that you'll ever believe the Word of God is when the Holy Ghost makes it real to you. That, that, that's when you will begin to believe and you'll begin to see the truth of this book. And, and, and so we'll see, we see this abject, obvious judgment of God from the king down to the very lowest man and notice the response. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us! Hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb of God. Now, they're still desiring to be hid. They do not cry out for mercy. 
They do not cry out for grace. They do not cry out for help. They cry out for the wrath of God. I mean, they cry out for to be hid from God. That is the natural state of man. And it has been that way from eternity past. It will be that way to the very end of mankind on this earth. It will always be that way except for the redeemed. And so we see there that that, that natural push of man is to avoid the judgment of God. Because you know what? If you can avoid the judgment of God, then God is not real. Right? And that's what they want. They want to be... Because you know what? If He's not real, you're not responsible to Him. But if He is real, and dear friend, He most certainly is, you're accountable to Him. Amen. And that, that, that's the part that, that mankind don't like. So even in the face, the scrolls have been rolled back, they visually can see him, they still cry, not to God, but to the earth to cover them up. Now go with me to Romans, uh, Romans chapter 14. Now, uh, Jared's been teaching us some good lessons from Romans. Uh, as I've told you many times before, I believe this is the church that defected and became the Catholic Church. Um, and you will find that Paul had concerns from the beginning. Now, in the midst of that letter, Romans 14, verse 11, Paul writes to them this, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Now, the, the, this idea of them, of being under rocks and being concealed and being hidden from God, has no real value. Right? Because what portion of man will bow and say, Thou art holy, O God? Is it going to be this? This has never had any usefulness from God for God since the time mankind fell. It'll be the inward man. And those trashy people that have blasphemed the name of God for centuries will bow and call him holy. Will bow and call him lifted up. Uh, <laughs> Church, it's time to let uh, the Cracker Barrel go. Uh, I love Cracker Barrel's turnip greens. I've not even been able to find, my mother-in-law can't replicate them. And uh, they're just amazing, but I'm gonna let it go. Yeah, uh, and I like the wheelchairs. We have three wheelchairs uh, on the front of our uh, porch from Cracker Barrel, right? And now they've got one that has their little flag on it. This is gay month for that bunch. Mm. You know what? I'd like to get that i like to get that thing and break it up in pieces and start a fire with it. You see what I'm saying? That will be held accountable. Now it may seem insignificant to me. But that's blasphemy in the, in the face of God. And they will be held accountable. And, and, and so we see the real, choice, the real force to this is not being accountable. They, they don't, probably in reality, they don't really care if God exists or not. They just don't want to be accountable to the God of the Bible. And, and there is a huge difference between that. And uh, now verse 12. So then, every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. You, you ever thought about what you will say to the Almighty? You know, when I, when I really begin to think of it, I tremble. Because I've let it down more than I've stood for it. 
I've disappointed him a lot more than I was faithful. But I do have a plan. Ever, everything that he rightfully brings against me, I'm going to name the name of Jesus. And you know what? He'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye in to the joys of the Lord. Because it's all about the notorious work of Christ. Amen. Now, these people have no idea about it. Uh, and, and Paul gives them a sound reminder. So uh, I want you to see the people who deny Christ have nothing to say at this point. Uh, what, the only way to avoid the judgment of Christ, I mean, excuse me, the uh, judgment of God is on the merit of Christ. It's just like Brother Jarrett said. Just believe. Sometimes as sovereign gracers, we make it a little complicated. Just believe. Trust. Put your whole, put your whole person in his hands. That is salvation. And so we see that's, that's how you stand in peace in the judgment of God. 1 Peter. First Peter chapter 4. In the very first verse. 1 Peter chapter 4. In the very first verse. The Bible says, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Now, as Peter is giving a general epistle, it was, it, it was shared with many, many of the churches. He, he reminds us, hey, you're going to suffer. You're going to have problems. And in fact, if you're not a little criticized, if you're not a little, uh, you know, give you the crossway look sometime, I'd be concerned. Because you're probably fitting in pretty good. And he, so he says to the churches, you're going to have problems in this life. And, and the whole thing is, you're not fitting in. You're, you're not part of the picture. You, you know, some of the things we say and we preach upon, people hate it. People despise it. You know, I, I read this uh, uh, thing on Facebook, and of course, certainly Facebook is not like the Bible, and, and you can't believe everything you read, right? But the World Health Organization, the WHO, uh, printed this thing and it said, people who do not agree to all the COVID vaccines hates mankind. That's a pretty scary thought, ain't it? Mm -hmm. You'll see, we're not only, will they say we're hating them, because I'm not taking them anymore. That's just me. That's why I'm trying to get my little place built up, because I guess I won't be nursing forever, right? They say it will come to you take them or you don't participate in this economy. Your social security stops, your pension stops, and your own your own. And, and you know what? It may not be COVID. It may be something else. It may be as something as simple as not taking that little chip. Yeah. And, and, and so we see that even then Peter understood and Peter looked back and Peter knew, hey, you're going to uh, suffer. And then he gives us this glorious encouragement. If you suffer, you've ceased from sin. In other words, if you don't, if you don't embrace that stuff, that means you love the Lord more than you love the world. But people are not going to like it. People are not going to appreciate it. 
But this, in fact, is the way to deal with the judgment of God. Verse 2, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Now, you, you, you think about yourself, and, and you answer for yourself, because I can't answer for you, but do you live to the flesh, or do you live unto Christ? Because, see, if you live unto Christ, it shows up just like the chicken pox all over you. You'll look like a Christian. You'll act like a Christian. You'll make decisions as a Christian does. You know what? My wife and girls don't wear dresses all the time to impress people, right? It's because of what the scripture teaches. And you know what? They're criticized for it. People make fun of them. I don't crawl into a pair of short britches so that I'll impress somebody. The Bible teaches me I need to cover my body, right? And you come out looking like a weirdo, right? Like, like a strange person. Well, don't you think this is what the scripture's teaching right here? That that's an anticipated outcome? That, that, that we will be different, that we will look different, that there'll be problems all along the way. But I want you to see that that's indicative of someone who loves God. Uh, there is no longer... The, that he no longer should live in the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of man, but to the will of God. Find the will of God and stick with it. Verse 3, for the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. Now, this is the will of the Gentiles, that we are saved by grace and that we look like God's people. Remember, remember what the comment in Acts was concerning the Gentiles who were saved? It said, they did the things of the law and they weren't even aware they were doing them. Because why? It was written on their heart. See, that, that's true redemption. That's redemption. That's salvation that you can take out here to the grave and when I'm gone say, well, I know what he believed. Amen. That's what we're to do. That, that, that is where we are to be. And, and, and so we find then that Peter is very, very specific on what a redeemed person looks like. People who are not under the judgment of God. When we walk in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, Revellings, banqueting, and abominable little idols. Now, I want to look at a couple of the uh, of these. Uh, and uh, first of all, we'll look at lust. And the problem with regular primetime TV is this: is that it will build your lust not only for sexual things; it'll build your lust for what this world has to offer. Uh, me and Brother Juddy was talking about how crazy the prices of property has just exploded. You know what? <laughs> this is all I can say. We don't have much, but that double wide is paid for. You see what I'm saying? But if I watch that mess every day, Jared's been looking for a house, and to me, very plain houses. <laughs> You know, Jared's not a man to be, uh, won't, won't to be recognized either, but very plain house is $350,000? Is that not crazy? But if you continue in the TV world, you take about any risk there was to get one. You see what I'm saying? That's lust. Lust will make you do things that are against logic. Right against what uh, God would have for us and even against what our ability can do. And, and so he warns us of, of, of lust interfering with our service to God, excess of wine. And, you know, down through the years, you just have to learn the word of God. But if, if you underline in your Bible, excess of wine. Now, I'm not 
uh, trying to tell you to be a drunkard, but listen, you cannot take the scriptures and exclude one altogether. There are things it's for. Honor the Lord's Supper, right? There's medicinal value in wine. A little wine for thy stomach's sake, right? That's what Paul told Tim, uh, Timothy. And I'm not encouraging you all to be wine bibbers, but I'm just saying you can't ignore the scriptures either. You see, and, and, and so we see that uh, he gives them a warning really about drunkenness. Now, uh, the Andersons don't know this, but I come from a long line of drunks. That's why I don't fool with it. I, I honor the Lord and the Lord's Supper and know that that's the right thing to do and that's the right, the right liquid to use. But my daddy was a drunk, his daddy was a drunk, and his daddy was a drunk. You know what that makes me? It gives me a strong propitiation to be what? A drunk. You see what I'm saying? And, and, and so we see that uh, as Peter is writing to the churches, he says, get this stuff out of your life. Don't let it be the dwelling. Don't let it be what's controlling you. Revellings, banquetings, just having a big celebration all the time. You know how these other churches are getting full and more full and more full? They're banqueting. They're not having church. They're banqueting. And abominable idolatries. We don't need a picture of Christ, long-haired hippie. We don't need a picture of Mary. You know what Mary was? She was a chosen vessel full of sin just like me. She is not to be worshipped in any manner or form. The twelve apostles, you know what they were? They were men used of God, period, the end, nothing else. And, and so I want you to see that in the modern day, these idolatries, it don't have to be uh, worshipping Buddha. It can be blended into Christianity, and it often is. And so we see that we're to avoid that. I don't want to be, I want to avoid the judgment of God, so I'm not going to be participating in that mess. Wherein they think it strange that you run not with them. That means they think you're a weirdo. Years ago, and I didn't know much then, but I knew it was stupid. They wanted to have an interfaith, and you two ought to remember this, that interfaith thing at Bumpus Mill where all the churches got together. And our pastor at the time, I'm not going to say exactly who he was, he was open to it. And the Methodists were going to get together, and the free willers were going to get together, and the Church of Christ was going to get together. And we were supposed to come too. Mm -hmm. How could I possibly sit down with a Church of Christ person and have banquets with him? We're polar opposites, or we should be. You know what the Methodists believe when you boil the water off? They believe in baptismal regeneration. They didn't come far from Mama. Right? So you see then, but you know what we looked like? We looked like the snobs. We were the ones criticized. We were the ones that were hateful and mean. Right? Don't get upset about that, John. You know why? Because I don't want to be held under judgment. You know, despite grace, you know what? We're accountable for what we do. If I led this church into that mess, and you know what? Every year in May, I get a letter, and Adam can tell you this because he usually gets the mail, to the Interfaith Conference of Stewart County. And Adam will hand it to me, and I'll throw it in his trash can back there. And you know why? Because I have no business doing that. And, and, and so we find and as we look unto Christ, and we certainly, I hope, would, would prefer not to have his judgment, it's not a popular thing to do. You will be criticized. You will be the one 
that's held accountable. <coughs> who, get, who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? Now this is the part of God and Jared stomped all over my message. This is the part of God we don't like and that is the judgment of God. The Bible says here, he's, he's ready. You know, uh, y'all y'all all been to Erin, I guess, maybe except the uh, Andersons, y'all ain't missed nothing. <laughs> and, uh, but down in the middle of town, and while they're there and, and not back come the busy end of town, I have no idea. There are two red lots within a block of each other. And literally, there's nothing down there but the courthouse. All the business has moved outside the main part of town. There's nothing going on. But sometimes you go through there and boom, it turns red. And I am sitting on ready, mad most of the time, because this stupid, literally nobody on the sides, and I'm here waiting at a red light, sitting on ready. And then when it finally comes, I get it. That's where God's at. When I, when I had my uh, 51, brother, when you kick it, it's going to go. And it, it, it will lay black marks if you want it to. And that's usually what I did. Because you know what? I was waiting to go. And it was frustrating to be waiting. You know what Christ is this morning? He's waiting for say, son, go get my children. And then he'll, he'll run and go get us. And seven years later, he'll be setting on ready again. And the Almighty will say, you go judge the earth. And he'll take off once more. I want to have an answer in that day, don't you? I want to have something to say. Mm -hmm. And all I know to say is Jesus Christ. All I know to say is grace, 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 grace. Because of all the other trash in my life, I have nothing to say. In fact, after studying the scripture, there's nothing I can say. Right? Yeah. Except grace, except Christ, except Lord, uh, I just give it all to you. That, that's all I'll have to say. Verse 5, and we're going to close. Who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and dead? For, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. Now, very under, unusual statement, and it'll help you understand things. You know what? I preach to the, the lost just as much as I preach to the redeemed. I don't get discouraged about that. Me and Brother Gray, he's a Southern Baptist preacher here in town. He came by my office, the nursing home, on Friday, and we got to talk. And we rejoiced. What sweet ease grace is. You can preach the gospel and leave it at the feet of Jesus. You don't have to beg nobody. You don't have to plead with them. You don't have to say, repeat this after me. Just take it to the Lord and leave it there. And that's what this is saying. Why then do they hear the gospel? Why, did, why do then they hear the preaching of the word of God? They'll have nothing to say. That's why. Do you ever think about this in two ways? And I guess I'm going to have to go into another character and stage somebody else up, but Marilyn O'Hare got preaching, taken out of uh, prayer, taken out of the public school system in the 60s. Yeah. You know what? She heard the gospel in two ways. Number one, she heard it when people would talk to her. And then this, most people don't know. Her youngest son was an independent Baptist preacher. And he told Mama of the goodness of God. Now, did Marilyn embrace it? Certainly not. But when she stands before the Almighty, she cannot say, I did not know. 
Right? <coughs> so, Jared, don't get discouraged when nothing happens. That, that, that's not part of your ministry. That's the ministry of Christ. For, for, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they may be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to to, to God in the Spirit. So this morning I, I ask you, are you going to avoid the judgment of God? Well, if you're saved, in one sense you will, because you have a plea that the lost don't have. That plea is grace. That plea is Christ. I'll say to Jehovah God, the great wonderful Father, your son is my brother. And he'll say, well done. Well done. And that'll be it. But for those of you that are lost, dear friend, you have no plea. You have nothing to say. And he will cast them, the Bible says, under judgment and ultimately into the lake of fire. You, you know, and, and there is a strong difference between hell and the lake of fire. The lake of fire is more painful. And on top of that, the lake of fire will never, ever possess the presence of God. Now we believe the Bible teaches being omnipresent, right? That's, that's where God is everywhere, always there, always, every time. That's the presence of God, right? Well, he won't extend that to the lake of fire. You know, I think he did extend it in the days of Abraham because, man, that, that rich boy was fully intact, wasn't he? In fact, he got a little mission-minded down there, didn't he? But see, that, that place won't exist in the time of the lake of fire. Abraham's, I mean, excuse me, uh, Abraham's bosom is gone. That's the old heaven. And it says, hell have enlarged itself. And I believe that was when Abraham's bosom was moved away into to the third heaven and it enlarged itself so many is going to hell. And then they will come up and they'll be accountable to the Almighty and he will say unto them, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. Right. And yeah. then they will be cast into the lake of fire. And then it's over, over. Done. Now I'm not sure in the present hell, how I'm assuming they're knowledgeable because the rich man was. But can you imagine being in a place where there's absolutely nothing but pain? That's what the lake of fire is all about. Look unto Jesus while you can.